So, good morning, everybody. Uh, here we are to think a little bit about um, another dimension of relevance for school dropout. And um, consistently with research and current evidences, student engagement is definitely one of the dimensions that we want to consider and to analyze in current approaches to uh, prevention of early dropout. So my uh, purpose today is to reflect with you uh, about this construct, which is relatively new in science, at least in this formulation. And this is my proposal for our uh, reflection. Firstly, I would invite you to reflect um, about why is that the interest on the construct of engagement emerged only recently. Secondly, I would uh, uh, invite you to reflect about what is student engagement with school. Thirdly, uh, I, would, uh, I will um, present some indicators uh, that help us to understand why is student engagement important when we are trying to prevent uh, dropping out. Uh, we will then see how and what basic conditions are needed to engage students. And uh, the following uh, structure will approach both systematic instruments for assessing student engagement with school. And then, if we have time, and I'm not sure, uh, we'll see how school and student characteristics shape students' experience with school as well as changes engagement over time. Then I'll try to make a little synthesis with some conclusions and suggesting you more and additional reading uh, on this. So let's setting up the context for better understanding what we are going to uh, talk about. So, uh, firstly, and before we try to define and understand the concept, I think it would be a very good idea to reflect a little bit on the context where student engagement uh, is in terms of research and conceptual matters. So, <clears throat> this is, uh, and this is uh, a, a comment I want to make uh, at first, what I'm going now to, to present you it is not uh, uh, empirical tested, so it's my uh, impression and my reflections about it, so take it as guide, uh, guiding for uh, reflection and not as scientific, scientific truth, okay? So, if we see uh, or if we analyze the history of uh, alphabet alphabetization in terms of uh, a systematic uh, method uh, that modern societies are taking to improve their common population's knowledge, being a student has changed. And in order to us to understand what engagement is all about, it's relevant to think a, bit, a little bit about what being a student is all about. And along the history of alphabetization, it started going to school, learning in a, a structured way. It started to be a privilege, only uh, of some. some. Then uh, it turned out to be clear that it was an opportunity to uh, break the uh, cycles of uh, disparities and social disparities, then became a right, 
then maybe a duty, uh, not only a right, but a student's duty and parents' duty, an occupation. It was clear uh, that it was somewhere in history and also now a way to reach an end, and it depends on the end, but it surely includes earning more, earning more money, income, in order to uh, achieve a better social status. Um, especially in some societies, being a student is clearly a practicum to professional life, a sort of ant camera of uh, uh, an exercise of a professional role. It became and still is also a social role. And mo uh, in more recent years, uh, we started to look at the students as a path and to being a student as a path for positive adaptation, and in a more holistic and comprehensive way, an identity issue as well, such as students' role identity. It also is clear for modern conceptions of what a student is, that it, being a student is a develop, development process, and the more recent approaches have Another dimension to that, it's not only a development process, but it's aimed to be a positive development process, and finally, a positive development and interactive process. Meaning that, uh, uh, in the contrary of, uh, uh, to what happened some years ago, students' uh, engagement is no more so as an individual dimension only, but a phenomenon that results from the interaction between individual and contextual dimensions. Um, <clears throat> and it is a fact that we all recognize that different disciplines and different scientific areas have interest to study engagement and students' engagement with school. Uh, and this may be for a lot of reasons, but obviously it only happens because being a student encompasses different dimensions. And each one of these dimensions are the object of study of different disciplines. Students' experiences are then perceived by the different approaches by different angles or different perspectives. This results in, a, in an, an impressive richness of perspectives about student experiences. It allows for contributions from disciplines with different methodologies and research traditions. And this is a proposal for us to better understand this. As you can see, um, in our days, we moved from in the bottom right from the common sense approach uh, of student uh, role and student engagement to uh, an approach from different perspectives according to the discipline uh, uh, of reference, including genetics and biology, which are trying to mapping the, ne the genetic influences on student behaviors and student performance, neurosciences, psychology, sociology, education, economics, management, political sciences, philosophy, theology, and health sciences too. I think that all of us in our professional practices have experience uh, about uh, the way that each one of these disciplines give a contribution or uh, uh, analyze some dimensions of uh, students' uh, function. The consequences of students being analyzed by different approaches are mainly two. On the one hand, 
students are perceived by each one of the approaches more by the perspective of each approach uh, uh, rather than on the perspective of the students. In other words, this results in the fact that uh, each approach uh, analyzes student engage engagement based on their own object of interest. The different contributions frequently remain separated, not contribute to, contributing to an integrated and holistic understanding of the multidimensional and dynamic nature of what being a student is. Different agents coming from different approaches use different labels, concepts and constructs to the same dimensions and frequently Qualita qualitatively different processes have been labeled by the same names. By other words, for example, depending on the disciplines we are coming from, for example, in sociology, uh, to the social economical status, the concept is, for example, social class, and for health and uh, uh, other social sciences, this is named by socioeconomic status. But these two concepts are not that different, so there is not a big problem. But in other cases, it raises a lot of problems. For instance, motivation is one of those such cases. For example, psychology, because it has different fra specific frameworks, has this conception about what motivation is, but sociology or philosophy may have another understanding of it. So what is the consequences of this? Obviously, this makes it, this make it difficult to have an integrated understanding of students' reality. Unfortunately, during too much time, this has prevented for a more efficient intervention in students' realities because at the center of the discussion, it was frequently the debate and the clarification of the concepts. This consumed too much energy and time and frequently distracted the agents from the disciplines, from the real needs of students' lives. In fact, one needs to be an expert in, need, in different areas to be able to understand if two from different disciplines are referring to different phenomena or if they are just different levels to the same phenomena. Fortunately, the importance of students' trajectories for today's societies, the maturation of the different disciplines and the impressive growth in the possibilities of communication between the disciplines allowed for some integration of the contributions coming from different disciplines. A better understanding of the dynamics underlying a student's experience and therefore to the placement of the student's experiences at the center of the debate rather than other side issues is a reality in our days. And uh, at the end of the last century, the concept of student engagement with school was proposed by some pioneers researchers, such as Finn in the United States in, for example, uh, 1989. Um, and after that, uh, it was a very little improvement and growth in this perspective. However, at the beginning of the 21st century, we uh, could assist to this huge and exponential growth in the um, growth of attention that this construct has received from the scientific community and uh, amongst mainly researchers, but also uh, practice, practice, uh, uh, technicians, uh, from different scientific disciplines and approaches. So, in our days, students' engagement with school is being increasingly acknowledged as a 
privileged platform for the integration of the different contributions, concepts, and constructs about the several aspects of students' experiences with school. So, said this, what is engagement with school? When we talk about engagement with school, are we referring to what, specifically? Well, there is a, a robust empirical evidence for the multidimensional nature of students' engagement with school. In fact, current tendencies tend to emphasize the need for integrative and multidimensional frameworks for, of students' engagement. Engagement with school, in spite of different frameworks, has been described as the student's subjective experiences uh, of connectedness and identification towards school aspects. As a subjective experience, engagement encompasses several dimensions, including emotions, cognitions, and behaviors. And each one of these dimensions are important aspects for the understanding of students' experience towards school, reason why they are considered as dimensions of engagement. So, this means, basically, that in analyzing students' subjective experiences with school, uh, characterized by connectedness and identification with school, we need to be attentive to three major aspects of that experience. The emotional, the cognitive, and the behavioral one. Until now, I think it's not new for any one of us. Uh, and engagement and student engagement is not aimed to bring something new uh, in terms of uh, novelty of uh, the reality, but to integrate the different aspects of experiences. So, in terms of what cognitive engagement is, we may define it as the representations students have about school, including motivations, expectations, and concepts and beliefs about self, others in school, and about the school itself. So, the more uh, the representations of students about school are um, uh, positive, the more co engaged and cognitively engaged the student is. In terms of emotional engagement, it refers to the affective dimensions of the experiences with school, including emotions and feelings set, such as joy, interest, or distress uh, when uh, uh, dealing with school aspects. And behavioral engagement refers to the actions of students towards school, including following rules, attendance to classes, and participation in school-related activities. Um, although there is a generalized uh, consensus about the importance of engagement um, for the understanding of student experiences, uh, um, for the understanding, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for, the, the stu uh, for the understanding of students' experiences with school, uh, there is still a debate about what the main dimensions and sub-dimensions are. For example, in what cognitive engagement is concerned, in what cognitive engagement is concerned, some frameworks suggest that it, cognitive engagement is a dimension composed by sub-dimensions, and these sub-dimensions for one are expectations, beliefs, or self-efficacy, for others, self-efficacy not, is not a part of cognitive engagement, so this debate is still 
uh, going on. In fact, current frameworks of student engagement vary in terms of the type and the number of dimensions uh, of engagement. And I'm uh, showing you uh, these two uh, uh, models that help us to understand what uh, dimensions and subdimensions are concerning the construct. This is a, a, a factorial structure of an instrument, and as you can see, at at left we have only uh, six dimensions, and then with several items to each one, and these are only sub-dimensions. But in the right uh, model, the model in the right, we can see that those dimensions of the left scheme are now grouped into higher order dimensions, and this was what I was referring to um, uh, when I was talking about the debate about what dimensions and subdimensions uh, make uh, part of the uh, student engagement construct. This is a framework, but what uh, is uh, important from here is uh, to r remember this uh, notion of factorial structure of a construct and how it is composed, including uh, the number of factors and their interrelation. So, uh, the current state of art in uh, school engagement with school includes a huge variety still of perspectives, with some frameworks considering only individual dimensions such as behavioral, emotional, and cognitive engagement. Uh, we others, other frameworks considering context dimensions also, such as family engagement with school, such as peer support for learning, such as teacher support for learning. Other frameworks which describe both individual and contextual dimensions with great disparity on the subdimensions included, individual or contextual, and on the status of those dimensions, lower or higher order dimensions. And I remember what higher and lower order dimensions are. The uh, dimensions closer, closest to the right are lower order dimensions, which are grouped in higher order dimensions. Okay, so also there are frameworks um, uh, considered both context and individual dimensions as higher factors, frameworks considering only lower order factors with balanced consideration of both individual and contextual dimensions and frameworks considered, considering only lower order factors, but with unbalanced consideration of the individual and contextual dimensions. For example, several individual dimensions and only one contextual dimension. This is not irrelevant, uh, although it may not be the most practical approach to student engagement, and although it may not be the main interest of uh, technicians and teachers and educators who are in the field, but um, it is not irrelevant. Why? Because frameworks of engagement have been inspiring, of course, the development of different measures of students' engagement with school. So these frameworks have strong implications for the daily practices because they inspire both the conceptions that techni technicians have about uh, what dimensions are needed to be uh, looked out and uh, they have also implications uh, to the way we assess and we measure and we capture these dimensions on students. 
The existence of multiple assessment measures, uh, in turn, derived from different frameworks, raises the questions of the equivalence of the concepts and constructs used by different studies, using different assessment instruments, which leads us back to the questions of the meaning of the results and the equivalence of concepts and constructs. By other words, this is where we began. Student engagement began uh, uh, as an attempt to uh, overcome this limitation, to overcome the different approaches and concepts, but indeed in its own development uh, is getting there too. This is not uh, serious. This is, this is part, obviously, of the process, but it requires some reflection and some uh, awareness from those who are working on this field. Um, make uh, this uh, uh, context and having this uh, approach to what engagement is, I would like to share with you, not in an in a exhaustive way, uh, some, of the, some theories about school engagement. I'm just going to uh, referring to them, some of uh, those I'm sure you, you know, but just to, as to uh, keep it in mind uh, uh, what kind of framework supports this construct. Um, one of the most uh, general frameworks uh, is the bioecological theory of human development, Broppenbrenner, of course, everybody knows it. And this is a good example of what I said before about the fact that engagement is an interactive uh, process because, as you know, a uh, bioecological model is an ecological model, so it uh, uh, relies on the assumption that different systems interact uh, um, and influence one uh, into another. And um, this approach or this framework is complementary to other specific approaches, such as self-determination theory, uh, which is a more individual uh, approach at the beginning, but uh, which acknowledge the importance of the context too. And as you know, self-determination theory uh, posits that in order to once achieve his, his or her own potential, uh, uh, we need to uh, satisfy three major psychological needs. The need of autonomy, the need of relatedness, and the need of competence. So this is a very important framework for understanding why some students are more engaged with school than others. And accordingly to this theory, that happens because different students in different schools are uh, differently uh, 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 connected to school because uh, those schools promote in different ways the fulfilling of the needs of being autonomous, of being uh, 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 loved and uh, um, related to the school and competent in the exercise of our roles. And in this uh, um, slide, you can see the three first theories. They are uh, clearly uh, interactionist theories, meaning this that these clearly are theories that posit that engagement is a bi- or tri-directional process including regulatory fit theory, which clearly suggests that students who are more engaged are those who uh, benefit 
for a better fitting with, between their own needs and the school responses to their needs. The second one, this expectancy value theory, uh, which is uh, 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 very suitable to uh, explaining student engagement with school, uh, highlights the importance of the student perception about what is happening and how it, uh, their expectations are met in their daily practices and achievement goal theory which became to be not a specific theory of engagement but it turned out to uh, uh, reveal itself to be adequate also to uh, conceptualize and uh, describe the process of students uh, engaging with school. Finally, flow theory, uh, uh, which is um, a positive development oriented theory, is also a theory of relevance for the understanding of student engagement, as it suggests that in order to a student being engaged with school, he needs to have these conditions that allow him for being able to flow uh, in their daily experiences with a sense of uh, spontaneously and uh, easygoing uh, and positive emotions during the, uh, the daily practices. Okay, so I hope that until now, uh, after we very briefly uh, uh, defined what student engagement refers to and after we place it in uh, the context of major theories of engagement, I would like to uh, reflect a little bit with you about the relevance of students' engagement with school for education and for school dropout prevention. Basically, the question is, why is student engagement important for education? Why is this construct, this concept, which really emerged in the last two, three decades only, and in terms of the history of uh, education, it's a short history, why it became so important in current uh, literature and practice. Uh, the reason why this construct of student engagement with school has reached a so impressive consensus relies on its predictive power of a wide range of students present, but also future processes and outcomes. In fact, uh, student engagement, and I remember this subjective experience of connectedness, relatedness with school is the strongest predictor of the grades, academic uh, performance, of uh, academic achievement, uh, which is different from academic performance, but I will not uh, enter here in details because uh, it's not needed for the discussion. It's the best predictor of the learning and the several learning processes. It's a strong and very strong predictor of disruptive behaviors at school, for example. And in previous occasions, we saw how uh, disruptive behaviors related to uh, negative academic outcomes. But, and most import importantly, mostly important to us, it's the strongest predictor of school dropout. And this is very, very important, and we'll see why. But most surprisingly, and this is very recent, this last uh, conclusion, uh, some studies are showing that student engagement is also a good predictor not only in the present, but uh, of lifelong achievements such as occupational status, such as the, the, the money P 
people earning and the psychosocial adaptation. So, different uh, dimensions of engagements, of engagement, of engagement, I'm sorry, are differently associated with different academic experiences, processes, and outcomes. That's why it's so important uh, that uh, distinct, distinction we made uh, between among cognitive, emotional, and behavioral engagement. Why is that distinction, distinction important? Because although they are different dimensions of the same process, therefore, although they are strongly related, they have different impacts on different aspects of students' lives. For example, cognitive engagement predicts more um, some aspects of uh, uh, schooling, such as grades or academic performance, but emotional engagement is more predictive, for example, of more functional and uh, well-being, uh, for example, uh, of students. And in the last years, fortunately, uh, and especially these two authors, Wang and Eccles, have made a huge contribution to this understanding. And they have recently published a several of papers, longitudinal and multi-level studies that are showing clearly first that different dimensions have different impacts on different processes but also during the time or, or along the time. So why again why is student engagement important? Student engagement is important for school, for each one of us, because it is both an outcome and a process. Okay, we saw that it is an interactive process. Parents influence their children's experiences with their example, with their beliefs, with their guidance which interact with student characteristics such as personality, such as uh, uh, age, gender, etc. And this uh, interaction uh, leads to a specific organization of psychosocial aspects uh, and in a dynamic way. Therefore, in each day, there are some contribution some contributions to this process. In other words, in each day, the previous organization uh, of psychosocial processes the student has is confirmed or infirmed by the present experiences. For example, if a student has a representation of uh, schooling uh, characterized by no interest, and in that day, his or her experiences confirm it, uh, it becomes more differentiated. So this is why student engagement with school is a process, because it's a malleable process and is um, 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 and is influenced by uh, current experiences and by what happens in real lives. But, and therefore, this is important because schools need to take this into consideration and need to be aware that in each day, the conditions that schools are offering to students, how teachers are, how the opportunities we are giving to students, etc., are becoming a part of each student process of development. So, no student is a closed 
uh, phenomenon, a closed box, each student, even those more vulnerable, even those more capable, are open processes that are sensitive to daily and consec consecutive uh, experiences. But it is also an outcome. And it is an outcome because in, the, in each moment, the way and the degree to which the student feels connected is a, a result of what happened until there. And what happened until there becomes the starting point for the process. So, on the one hand, and specifically for uh, preventing school dropout, uh, stu student engagement as an outcome is very important because inform uh, educators about how close the student is or uh, inform educators about the path, about w what we can expect uh, of these students in the short time. Uh, it, it, uh, considering student engagement as an outcome, it's very important because it helps us to uh, uh, understand where the student is at the moment. For example, if it is uh, highly engaged or if it is low engaged, and in this case, he needs or he or she needs prevention interventions, uh, preventative interventions, I'm sorry. But uh, as a process, it, it informs also the outcome. So this fact, the fact that student engagement is both a process and an outcome, is another, um, uh, another um, aspect that helps us to understand the interactionist uh, nature of engagement. And this fact puts student engagement with school at the center of the daily educational practices. Uh, there is no way uh, of educators do not be sensitive to this in each and every practice uh, and educational practices. Why? Because we are, and we saw it, in the middle of a process. And we are in the middle of a process which have the potential of confirming the current uh, psychosocial organization or inferring uh, the, that organization depending on what we think it is desirable for that specific student. So, um, now I would like to uh, reflect a little bit with you about the implications of students' engagement uh, construct to daily school practices. And more specifically, the importance of teachers' role uh, to promote positive engagement with school. Basically, we'll try to answer to the question, how can we promote students' engagement with school and what basic conditions are needed in order to achieve higher levels of students' engagement with school. This is, in fact, two major questions in what concerns uh, research on students' engagement with school. And in this uh, uh, attempt to answer to these questions, we need to take or to consider at least two perspectives. The individual perspective and the contextual perspective. In what, co in, in what concerns individual perspectives, perspective, um, and in our daily practices, we know already that student engagement with school 
predicts several outcomes and processes. But what is interesting is that the school engagement itself is predicted by several individual characteristics. This means that depending on student engagement, uh, on the student's characteristics, it is very likely that uh, different trajectories on student engagement with school, with school uh, will um, happen between students. And the most strong, the strongest predictors of individual predictors of uh, student uh, engagement with school is age, gender, social economical status, and personality. Let me uh, reflect a little bit um, about each uh, one of them. <clears throat> Why is age a predictor of uh, engagement? We know that the younger the student is, the more involved he is in school. He or she is in school. And clearly, during the schooling years, it is international uh, 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 confirmed by several studies conducted internationally that uh, student engagement decrease uh, along the schooling years. And this is, uh, this is related with several aspects. Firstly, it has to do with the maturation and differentiation of psychological uh, processes. For example, a student with 11 years old, in terms of representations, remember, cognitive engagement, representations, emotional uh, 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 experiences and behavioral experiences, uh, an 11, uh, 11 years old student, first, uh, is still very dependent on the family and school structure to their behaviors and to their experiences. And secondly, uh, their uh, representation of reality and uh, specifically their cognitive uh, uh, aspects of functioning are still under development and are uh, not still fully uh, differentiated. This means that uh, among uh, 100 students, for example, uh, they tend to have a more similar representation of reality than uh, students, 100 students, for example, with 20 years old. Because why? Because with 20 years old, our representations are already more complex, have a lot more of elements, and so result in more uh, differentiated uh, understanding of reality. But secondly, age and specifically uh, the schooling years is also a strong predictor of engagement, uh, leading to a tendency to decreasing because during the schooling years, first, the academic work will complexify, which tend to lead to an increased odds of receiving negative feedbacks about his or her own performance, which in turn tend to have an impact on the connectedness with school because um, it should not be like, like that, of course, but uh, especially in those students who start with poor academic trajectories, especially in those students uh, who start with low performance, no one likes to suffer, of course. So if a student 
receives a lot of negative feedback is to organize his or her own experience in a way that inform him that is not a pleasant place to be because the feedback he receives tells information about his or her uh, which is not very positive and pleasant. So, uh, um, this helps to understand, remember, engagement is about connectedness and relatedness. And we tend to connect and to relate to things that we identify to and that are pleasant to us. Um, I think that in terms of age... Oh, and there's another uh, factor too, which is um, as students grow up, the possibilities of occupation rises. Uh, with 11 years old, uh, when we have 11 years old, there is not much options. But when we have 16, 18 years old, there's other options already. I mean, this depends obviously on the society, but one with 18 years old or 70 years old or 60 years old have other options uh, uh, rather than being in school. For example, working, uh, not doing nothing, being with friends. And because the influence and uh, control of parents tend also to diminish uh, along the years uh, uh, in the opposite direction of students' autonomy, they are uh, um, left in a, a, a more by their own and more dependent on their own choices. So, Sometimes their choices are not consistent or pro-school, so we can assist to a decrease, a tendency for decrease in engagement over years. Second um, uh, predictor, individual predictor of engagement is gender. And uh, several studies are consistent uh, in showing that girls tend to be more engaged with school than boys. And I'm not going to uh, take a lot of time in this issue because we all are aware of the cultural influences on gender uh, issues and uh, gender identity and gender roles. So we are all aware, that, and this again depends on the societies, but um, for example, in uh, Portugal and in Mediterranean uh, countries, girls, at least in the last deca decades, uh, uh, are being very encouraged, even in terms of gender equal equality, to invest in school as a way of uh, being more autonomous, of being uh, more empowered and of being more equal. Why is social economical social economical status a predictor of engagement? Because social economical status is um, is uh, all about resources is all about mainly external resources, such as money, such as parents' uh, educational status, and therefore parents' expectations uh, towards their sons and daughters, uh, parents' investment in terms of time, in terms of priorities, and these obviously create conditions for students' development. But also, and precisely as a consequence of that, social economical status is also about internal resources. Because if one has the access of learning opportunities, of development opportunities, 
and not only to opportunities, but to quality opportunities, is very likely that the quality of the opportunities the students assess to influence the experience, which in turn will impact on the quality of the development of the internal experience. So, the richer experience student has access to, the, the more and uh, richer uh, resources parents have to make to their children um, available the conditions for development, the higher pro-school and pro-learning uh, organization the student tend to develop. And finally, personality. These three first predictors are consensual. Uh, research is uh, converging uh, on that, but a current uh, challenge on student engagement with school is understanding uh, its personality underpinnings. Why? Because personality refers to dynamic organizations of psychobiological processes and psychobiological organizations influence and include affects or emotions and cognitions, but also influence and includes, for example, self-regulation. Uh, spontaneous self-regulation. So, some personality profiles are more likely to be self-regulated and so more consistent what the structure needed to do well in school, such as self-discipline, such as uh, compliance with rules, and other profiles. For example, uh, a specific profile uh, 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 which is being called by disorganized profile is a huge risk factor for a lot of negative outcomes, but including and also for uh, uh, poor uh, student engagement with school. Okay, so in terms of contextual uh, perspectives, remember that we said that uh, student engagement with school is an interactionist process, an interactive process. So those individual predictors interact with contextual characteristics, including family characteristics, which we approach already when we talked about socioeconomic status, but not only. Uh, and uh, at this respect, uh, it's interesting because although family more than social economic status, in terms of what uh, students' engagement is concerned, um, the most studied, studied factor is uh, uh, socioeconomic status. So other dimensions of family characteristics and functioning are not that clear yet, and uh, evidences are not uh, uh, so many and consensual yet. So I will, in terms of family characteristics, rely for now on the social economical status, which we uh, uh, approach already before. And what about school characteristics? Well, this is a huge uh, discussion. This could be by itself a webinar uh, because uh, this is a very, very important uh, thing. Why? First, we all agree that it is important to promote positive engagement. We all agree that some of the predictors of engagement are individual, our family, and our school characteristics. And 
amongst these, all these factors, school characteristics are those who are most suitable for political intervention. By other words, there are no political interventions that can uh, be made to change the predictor of personality directly. Or, I mean, there are interventions that have and can have an impact on personality development, but it's a distal impact. In order to reach engagement, it's a distal impact. So, societies, in terms of what school is concerned, can, in fact, uh, design political and strategical options in order to uh, increase and in order to make the conditions for a positive student engagement. So the question is, is it worthy? In other words, does school have any impact on student experiences, including student results and student engagement? Well, as you, uh, I'm sure, all know, this is a huge debate that started uh, in the last century and to which uh, several authors gave huge contributions. I remember here that now in education there is this line of research of school effects. And school effects, it's a research and discipline, disciplinary approach which began, began about 30 years ago with the classic studies of Coleman about the cases of Catholic schools. In the United States, and I am not going to uh, develop this in deep, but in the United States, it was this phenomenon that students in Catholic schools systematically uh, uh, performed better than other schools in several outcomes of education. And this has led researchers to trying to understand why. So this classic study, Coleman, uh, developed by Coleman and colleagues, was the first uh, or one of the first attempts to uh, try to understand this. And, but at the time, the results were controversial and were contradictory because the first results showed that school characteristics didn't have any impact whatever they were on students' experiences. By other words, these, students, these uh, first uh, stu uh, studies showed that, well, truly, there is no difference between a student go to this school or that school because mainly what schools are doing is to replicating the vulnerabilities or the potential that students bring from home. And this was very obviously disappointed to, disappointing to researchers who strongly believed that their was not the case. But before continuing this uh, line of thought, let me just to uh, uh, remember what are we talking about when we talk about school characteristics. School characteristics, and I am very pleased uh, of working with a, a researcher who I respect very much, uh, uh, named uh, Valerie Lee from Michigan University in the United States, who was one of the pioneers in what concerns school characteristics. And she developed this framework about what school characteristics are and which 
full correct characteristics, we need to consider to measure uh, the impact of school in students. And her approach includes uh, four main uh, characteristics. School structure, school uh, social organization, school academic organization, and um, um, the third one I'm not remembering now. <laughs> but I, I will, uh, it will come uh, in a minute. School structure refers to a structural aspect of school, such as size, number of students, uh, if it is a rural or a urban school, etc. Does this have any impact? She asked. Being private or public school, being Catholic or not Catholic. The other uh, dimension, school social composition, was all about the average composition of school population, mainly students' population, but also teachers' population, including the average of students' social economic status, but also um, uh, other student characteristics. School academic organization uh, includes the um, pedagogical approach and pedagogical offer that school makes available to students, including courses and the uh, degree of demanding of the courses, the number of uh, courses students attend to. For example, uh, stu uh, Math A or Math B. I don't know if uh, uh, for some of you this makes any sense. We had already with some of you this conversation. But basically, um, in some schools, uh, there are this possibility of students taking math in a, a, a consumer or user point of view, more basic math, such as statistics or uh, something like that. And in, there are other offers of more... Uh, complex math more suitable for those students who want to follow, for example, uh, sciences or um, other related disciplines. Uh, so, this was a huge contribution she made. She made this framework that allowed us to think in a structured way about what school is about in terms of its potential of impacting school students' engagement. But this happened at the same time of another uh, event which was happening at the same time. And that one was in, uh, at the level of statistical methodology for analyzing data. Until, the, until very recently, um, the approach of, uh, to the uh, context and individual influences and interactions w did not take into account the hierarchical nature of uh, the school populations. By other words, in a school, students are nested in classes and classes are nested in schools. So, in order to see the impact of the school characteristics on students' functioning, we need uh, statistical methodologies that are able to estimate the relative predictive power or the relative impact of the school and the individual. In other words, we needed 
for a methodology which were able to dismantle, to differentiate the variance which was attributed to the school and the variance which was attributed to students. And this methodology was not available until the works of some pioneers in the end of the last century, such as Ravenbush, who developed this software and this statistical approach called by multi-level analysis. And this was a huge advance for what school characteristics and its impact on students' functioning um, had. Uh, again, Professor Valerie Lee, I told you about, and Radham Bush and other authors, um, since the la very last uh, years of the last century, very last 90s, and the uh, early uh, 20s, uh, came out with some very uh, classical studies about this. And they uh, brought some clarification to the question we raised before. Does it matter the school, does the school characteristic matters? And within, by using this methodology, all studies or almost studies are showing that yes, school characteristics matter. And they, in a very uh, important way for the advance of research on this area, uh, explained why the previous studies um, uh, had found what they found. By other words, why did the previous studies uh, suggested that schools didn't matter. And I'm not going uh, deeply on that, but basically that, as we all know, uh, is associated to the fact that before this methodology, how did they uh, estimate the school effect? Very simple. They had two possibilities. By aggregating information from all students of a school and creating a composite indicator for that school, for example, taking the average of every student and using that average as the school reality, or disaggregating, starting by the whole indicator and dividing uh, uh, by the students' uh, units. Of course, that, and as we said before, this is not adequate for phenomena uh, who are hierarchical, because by only summing and uh, estimating the average of students, we do not have into account that students are nest in schools and in, in classes, and uh, classes are nested in schools. So, um, with that methodology, we could not, not uh, able to uh, separate the variance, uh, the variance uh, due to each one of these agents. So, with these multi-level approaches, and multi-level because it takes into consideration the school level, the class level, and the student level, the research shows that, in fact, school characteristics matter. And coming back to uh, student engagement with, with school, what then uh, this research tell us about the impact that school characteristics have on students' engagement with school. Does all 
school characteristics have influence on students' engagement with school? Firstly, research started by another question. It was not on engagement, but the first interest was on performance. And interestingly, they um, uh, concluded that for academic performance, there were some school characteristics that mattered. For example, v being private or public did matter. For example, uh, Professor Valerie Lee found mixed results from, for example, school size. She found that for very small uh, uh, schools, uh, there was no positive uh, um, impact for students, but neither for huge schools. When the size had a positive impact was in th those cases where the school number, the, the student number was in the middle, not very little schools, not huge schools. This is what, just one example. But Considering uh, engagement, uh, and I uh, again will uh, refer to Professor Valerie Lee because in 99 she published, 99 already, uh, almost 20 years ago, she published one of the classic studies in this area where she proved that, for example, uh, schools with low expectations in terms of excellence, in terms of mastery, did not promote engagement. By the, on the contrary, she proved that um, uh, in order to school have a positive impact on engagement, it was needed a, a, a balanced, uh, excellent, excellence, and mastery-oriented uh, approach. Um, I don't know how, how many time I have, but maybe we are finishing? More five minutes, okay. So, um, I'm just then finishing and introducing you uh, the question of how to measure in our daily practices student engagement with school. How can we recognize indicators uh, of engagement? How uh, can we uh, tell that a student is more or less engaged uh, in a systematic and not only impressionist way? Because, okay, we can, uh, by common sense, have this impression about the student, but in order to be accurate, and because all of what, because all of what we said, students' engagement with school is too important to be approached by an impressionist approach only. Because of its importance, we need to have a structured and reliable approach to the, the indicators of engagement to how measure indicators of engagement and how capture and identify students at different levels of engagement. Why? Because this will allow us to have confidence in identifying student, students specially placed at risk for disengagement and then to develop specific oriented uh, interventions to prevent school dropping out. We will um, deal with this later. So um, for now, I think it's already enough and I uh, really appreciate your uh, attention. I don't know if you have some questions or if is time for that. No? Okay. Is...
it's working. Well, the most interesting part for us working in the field is coming now. Uh, so we will do that in the workshop, I hope. I wonder why you didn't make a slide about the school characteristics, because the story was very important, but there was no slide yes. with the keywords or the main points, mm -hmm. so that could be a tip for next time. Yeah. And um, you have drawn a very historic picture, and um, my main question is that now uh, the school engagement and the school dropout is a multidisciplinary thing. Is it still possible that all disciplines together in the practical field can help the schools and school organizations to work with practical tips and guidelines in daily life? But I suppose that will come later. So, but is that still possible? But it seems that so many studies are busy studying this theme that scientifically it's all very interesting, but what does it mean for the people who work in the field? That's the main okay. question. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, actually, I, uh, I think you are right. And um, uh, um, I am aware of that. But I choose this approach because, in my opinion, the best way of helping who is in the field is allow or creating the conditions to really understand the whole picture and not the instrumental aspects only. Because the instrument aspects are only that, instruments, which can be used in several ways if equally efficiently if we have a clear notion about their underpinnings. And by knowing this historical point of view, I was thinking on um, promoting on you this deeper understanding of uh, what student engagement is, uh, because working in promoting student engagement without knowing this, in my opinion, may result in an uh, incomplete understanding of uh, about what we are doing. So I knew the risks of doing this choice, but uh, between the two possibilities, uh, I chose to, uh, and I assumed this was an introductory webinar, so I chose to um, uh, describing this uh, context first and then uh, uh, to uh, allow for the uh, exploration of instruments. Because, for example, when uh, you will uh, uh, contact with the instruments, uh, you will recognize many things uh, of what we said here. If we didn't have this, I am not sure if those aspects will be achieved. So uh, I agree with you. And in, if I were a technician, I would prefer uh, more instrumental and practical issues. But in order, as uh, uh, in terms of understanding the phenomena, I think uh, this was important too. But we never uh, win all, so I hope that at least this is important and we have the opportunity to develop the other issues later. Thanks, Paul, for uh, your uh, uh, explanation. And um, uh, my, my question is uh, about the predictions. One of your goals of uh, your work is uh, uh, can predict something about school engagement. Yes. My question is uh, uh, can predict 
really, uh, especially in the first years of uh, schooling, mm -hmm. because the first years are, uh, I think, uh, a very important variable mm -hmm. to, the, um, to the, the engagement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the beginning of uh, schooling, uh, I think that the experience of students change a lot. Yes. Um, so, my question is about prediction. Can you predict? Okay, that's, that's a very, very, very good question, uh, Josh, and I really appreciate it. Um, as the name itself means, prediction uh, relies on odds and probab probabilities. So, when we talk about predicting, we talk about being confident about the odds of that be will happen. Of course, that uh, statistical methods such as probabilistic uh, uh, tests and uh, hypothesis tests uh, do only that. They estimate the probability of that happened and inform us about the degree of confidence we may have in that uh, prediction. Or, by other words, they inform us how, about the confidence we may have about an anticipation of a given result. And the question is, are those methodologies reliable? Are they really uh, making a good job in predicting? Well, the best and I think the only way of proving it is to compare what was predicted and what, was, what happened. And this obviously requires and demands for longitudinal studies. And fortunately, we have a lot of longitudinal studies that are showing us that the first those characteristics and the values that these variables assumed at an early point of school development really uh, um, predicted, I was trying to use another word, the, what uh, uh, turned out to be the reality. So, in not in 100% uh, of sure, of course, but in a accept, acceptable and scientifical acceptable uh, degree, yes, we can predict. The, at least in say, in, in, it's not, uh, and I want to make this clear, it's not a linear association. I mean, it's not a linear prediction, it, but it's a non-linear because it's dynamic and we must remember here two principles, the equifinality principle and the multifinality pr principle that help us to understanding that. Because, for, for example, the same risk factor may be involved in different trajectories, multifinality principle, and for other students, uh, they have the same outcome coming from different uh, risk factors. But in development psychology, this is how uh, we uh, can uh, describe the de development, but what we know is that they are reliable enough because what we have seen is that there is a very, very strong association um, uh, between what it was predicted and what it was found. Thank you. So, there is no more questions? So we can look forward to more webinars because that's what I understood from your words before. Um, 
Well, uh, that's a thing uh, uh, to predict. <laughs> I don't know. In <laughs> as far as I am concerned, I obviously am fully available for what you consider uh, relevant. That's not a problem, right? <laughs> okay, people, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.